Let's look a little at heart homeostasis and aging of the heart. First of all, think about how does your body know when to change your heart rate? How does your brain know what your blood pressure is to monitor this? Well, one thing that definitely has an effect on your heart rate are baroreceptors. When you look at a little prefix on this word here, baro, right? A little word meaning pressure. Now, you can think of these sensory receptors as pressure receptors or stretch receptors because what they're really monitoring is how much of the wall of certain arteries are being stretched. And, of course, as pressure increases, the wall gets stretched more. The pressure drops, it gets stretched less. Now, first of all, look at where you find these baroreceptors in the internal carotids and the aorta. Think about why the body would use these arteries to monitor your blood pressure. Well, first look at the aorta. That is what the left ventricle pushes blood into, and that aorta branches off into other arteries, which go from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. So if everything else is held constant, when pressure changes in the aorta, changes everywhere else. So that's definitely a good pet place to monitor blood pressure. And then also monitoring the internal carotids. These are the biggest flows of blood to your brain. You better maintain enough blood flow to your brain or you're not going to live for very long. But think about when you're sitting. Heart's not beating very fast or with much force and it's pushing blood into the arteries but not that much and they only get stretched a small amount. When they're stretched a small amount they'll send action potentials back to the brain infrequently. In other words not very often. So the brain knows that low frequency from these receptors <clears throat> means low pressure. So you start to get up and run. Heart's going to pump a lot more blood into these arteries and the wall's going to stretch more. When they stretch more, they send action potentials back to the brain more frequently. So the brain knows that a high frequency means high pressure. It can adjust your blood pressure, your heart heart rate, stroke volume, all that as it needs to, to keep your blood pressure right, right for what you need at that moment. But in addition to using baroreceptors, you also use chemoreceptors. Now look at what these chemo or chemical receptors can detect and monitor. Things like changes in pH. <clears throat> when you talk about changes in pH, you're talking about monitoring hydrogen ion concentration. Now remember when pH drops, decreases, that's when there's more hydrogen. That's an acid. Something's getting more and more acidic as the number gets lower. So as the pH drops, as more and more hydrogen, heart rate tends to increase, largely because hydrogen and carbon dioxide tend to go hand in hand. If you look at this chemical reaction down here, this is a very discussed reversible chemical reaction in the human body. If you look at what's in it, you can see carbon dioxide likes to combine with water. This will yield H2CO3 carbonic acid. Now this will dissociate down into hydrogen and bicarbonate on. Now anytime you've got a reversible chemical reaction, whatever happens to one side happens to the other. This is always trying to reach equilibrium. So again, go back. If your pH is dropping, meaning that hydrogen is building up in the blood and body, well, if hydrogen builds up, CO2 builds up. How do you get rid of carbon dioxide? <clears throat> Exhaling. So your heart rate would increase to pump more blood to your lungs. At the same time, you'd breathe faster and blow off that carbon dioxide. And when the CO2 levels drop, hydrogen levels will drop. Respiratory system is your number one pH balancing system because of this CO2 and hydrogen going hand in hand. Just the opposite of this would apply too. pH is increasing meaning there's less hydrogen, there'd be less CO2, your heart rate and your breathing would slow to retain more carbon dioxide at that time. So here we just mentioned the carbon dioxide. That goes hand in hand with the hydrogen right there. Again, if CO2 and hydrogen build up, your heart's going to pump more blood to the lungs. That way, at the same time, you breathe faster and blow off that carbon dioxide quicker. You don't ever exhale the hydrogen but when you balance the CO2, you balance the hydrogen at the same time. You also have chemoreceptors for oxygen. <clears throat> if oxygen levels were to drop, heart rate's going to increase to try and pump more oxygen out to the body and the tissues. And of course, just the opposite would apply too. So these chemoreceptors are very important when it comes to what's happening with your heart. You can also look at body temperature. All chemical reactions inside your body are temperature dependent. 
So in short, when temperature goes up, chemical reactions occur faster and your heart beats quicker at that time. Just the opposite would apply too. Look at some effects of aging of the heart. Now when you're sitting and resting, you don't really see much of any change in what's happening with your heart. You're not going to really notice any harmful effects which might have occurred over the decades. But as you get older, you often hear about this left ventricle enlarging. Think about why that would be. As you get older, you often hear about your arteries hardening. You're going to build up plaque in the wall and you're going to lose the elastic fibers in the wall too. And if you lose that elasticity, <clears throat> those arteries are now smaller. They won't stretch. And if they're smaller than what they were before, you can't pump as much blood through them. And of course, your heart's going to have to work harder. And if your left ventricle has to work harder to try and pump more blood through these smaller arteries, it's going to enlarge. Because if you take any muscle and work it harder and harder, it's going to get bigger. And again, when you're at rest, you're not really going to notice these changes that happen very gradually. But then when you exercise and that heart's having to work against higher pressure, then you're definitely going to notice some differences. You won't have the cardiac output that you did when you were younger. So hypertrophy of that left ventricle goes hand in hand with changes that raise your blood pressure. Again, remember the blood's only going to move away from the heart when the pressure is higher at the heart <clears throat> and lower everywhere else. So when you raise your blood pressure everywhere else in the body, heart has to work harder, Blood's not going to move as easily as what it did before. You're also often going to see failing of the valves. Now think about of the valves in your heart, which one is likely to fail first? Well, look at the chambers of the heart. The pressure in the atria is very, very low compared to these ventricles. It's way more pressure in them. When you look at the pressure in the ventricles, it's way higher in the left one. Because remember, your right one just has to push blood to your lungs. Doesn't have to move blood very far, doesn't have to generate a lot of pressure. But the left one has to move blood from the top of your head to tip your toes. There's somewhere around 2,000 millimeters mercury pressure inside this left ventricle when it's contracting very forcefully. That's an enormous amount of pressure in this bicuspid, this mitral valve, also called the left atrioventricular valve, is the valve that has to stop the backflow when this chamber is contracting and generating pressure. So when you look at these four valves in your heart, <clears throat> this bicuspid is under the greatest stress. It has to stop more pressure than the others. So that's why that is usually the first valve that almost always fails in the heart. Doesn't have to be, but usually it is. And if the blood starts to backflow through this bicuspid, look at where it's going to backflow to, the lungs, because that's where this blood just came from. And that fluid will start to backflow into the lungs and congestive heart failure can occur at that time. Left side congestive heart failure occurs when that left pump fails, blood flow backs up into the lungs. And when you get fluid in the lungs, you don't get out the CO2, you don't get in enough oxygen, and that leads to very big problems there. But look at some of the common medications you hear about with aging of the heart. Nitroglycerin is commonly used. It's a very powerful vasodilator. A lot of people think that this only dilates the blood vessels leading to the heart. No, it doesn't. It dilates blood vessels everywhere in the body. <clears throat> now think about this. People often carry the nitroglycerin when they're at risk of having a heart attack. What causes a heart attack? Not enough oxygen being delivered to those cells for aerobic respiration. It's often caused by inadequate blood flow. So if someone's having a heart attack, you need to get more blood and oxygen to that cardiac muscle. Well, take nitroglycerin. It'll dilate the blood vessels going to the heart, which will give it more blood and oxygen. But at the same time, it dilates blood vessels all around the body, and that will lower your blood pressure. <clears throat> a lot of people would think, you want to lower your blood pressure when you're having a heart attack? Absolutely. Because remember, your heart has to work against the pressure in those arteries. You take a vasodilator and lessen that pressure. Now it's easier to move blood because the pressure is lower. That eases the workload on the heart. So now you've eased the workload on the heart. It's not using up ATP and oxygen like it was before. And at the same time, you're sending more blood and oxygen to it. Great way to stop a heart attack right there. D, 
digitalis, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, others are good at slowing and strengthening the heart. And that's what makes a good heart. A slow beat. It's not using up a lot of oxygen and a very strong, forceful contraction that's pushing a lot of blood. That's what you want to see. But look back again at the heart. Remember, it's got two pumps. It has got a right pump and it's got a left one. <clears throat> look what the right pump does. Pumps blood out of the body into the lungs. Again, all the blood from the body comes in the right side. Right ventricle pushes it to the lungs. Left pump does just the opposite. As soon as that blood goes through the lungs, it comes right back into the left side of the heart. So this side is pumping it out of the lungs and out to the body. Of course, it comes right back to the right side again. Now, of these two pumps, think about which one is most likely to fail first, the left one, because it has to work way harder than what the right one does. So when somebody has a heart attack, it's usually on the left side of the heart, in this left pump, in this left ventricle. If this pump starts to fail, look at what you've got, a strong pump pushing blood to the lungs and a weak one trying to pump it out. Fluid's going to start to backflow into the lungs. Get that fluid build up, you're not going to get in enough oxygen and out enough carbon dioxide. It's left side congestive heart failure. But someone could lose muscle in this right pump. Maybe they had a heart attack or something such as that right there. Now think about what will happen if the right pump fails. Now the left one is still strong, pushing it out to the body. Now the weak right one can't pump it out. And now blood's going to start to backflow into the body. And first of all, down through this inferior vena cava to the liver because there's an enormous amount of blood coming back from that liver to that right side of the heart. So here blood's gonna backflow into the body where if the left pump fails, back into the lungs. Very commonly seen, right, excuse me, left side over here and right side congestive heart failure over here.